No, really. There it I is. Guess. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. We are on Exodus. Um, we're going to really kind of pick up chapter three, but I'm going to take the roughly the paragraph before. So Exodus 2, 23 is where we'll pick up today. Um, so we will... Uh, Take a look, pages 10 and 11 in our study guide is uh, where we're going to pick up. So let's, uh, let's start with prayer and uh, dive in. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship. We ask that you would be with us, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we read and study your word, that we would grow in our faith and understanding of you as the Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, um, so Exodus 1 and 2, you cover a lot of history. You cover basically uh, 400 years of Israelite history in those two chapters. You know, just picks right back up where you end in Genesis with the uh, family of Jacob having moved to Egypt where Joseph, uh, Jacob's son, takes care of them through the famine. Um, and then time goes by, regime changes, new pharaohs, and they don't remember what Joseph had done for them. And so they put all of the uh, Israelites into slavery. And then even though the Israelites are still prospering in slavery, Pharaoh issues the edict to kill all the Israelite boys and subdue the population that way. Um, still basically uh, backfires uh, it, where it brings us to one of our you know, main characters through the book of Exodus, the author, Moses. Uh, his story where um, his parents um, in faith uh, hid him, even though they were supposed to kill him. And then three months sent him down uh, the river to where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing. Pharaoh's daughter plucks him out, saves him. Uh, so we looked at that uh, last time. And then after 40 years, when Moses was about 40 years old, he kills an Egyptian who was mistreating an Israelite, thinking, hey, maybe now is the time. Lord will use me as a, as a deliverer, um, but instead it's not positively received. And so he flees Egypt, goes to Midian, and there finds a wife, Zipporah, um, has what we'll find out, two children. Um, we just heard about the first one being born. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, one thing we did hear about, um, so Zipporah's father, Jethro Ruel, uh, both names are his, um, was called a priest of Midian. Uh, so just that note, just so you know, where would this priest of Midian come from? Uh, Midianites were descendants of Abraham through his wife, Keturah. Uh, Keturah is the wife uh, Abraham married after Sarah died. Um, because of this connection, perhaps Jethro led others in worship of the God of Abraham and Isaac, as did Melchizedek. Midianites as a whole seem to have been nomadic uh, desert dwellers who were later enemies of Israel. So coming from the same family line and maybe from that uh, would have had that shared faith. All right, so Moses is there and then we're going to pick up uh, verse 23, chapter 2, verse 23 um, to take us into chapter 3. So during that long period, so this is 40 years, Moses is going to be 80 when we meet back up with him in chapter 3. So during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So uh, page 11 in the study guide, verse 24 talks about God remembering his covenant with the Israelites. Did God ever forget about them? I don't believe so. No, I don't think so, because God doesn't do that, right? God doesn't just forget about us. Um, so why use the phrase remembering? How should we understand the phrase remembered his covenant? So if he's not forgetful, why use this phrase, remember his covenant? What does the Hebrew say? Remember his covenant. <laughs> it does use the word remember. Because you know sometimes how translations can kind of skew it a little bit. 
Well, there is one we're gonna, we'll talk up later in the book of Exodus, um, where there is an English translation choice, but I think it is a very good English translation choice um, and not too terribly literal. I don't know is, is remember be any, any worse of a word choice, because if it's like, oh, we're going to go such and such place after church, and then it's like, hey, remember to that we're going to such and such place. I remember. Yeah. I think that's maybe maybe a, a good, pretty good way to, to take it um, is generally when the Bible puts us in that God is remembering something, what you're going to hear next is him acting on it. Uh, so it's it's remembered, um, not that in terms of it's forgotten, but that they're going to go forward with it. Um, God's going to say, OK, we have uh, this covenant and now we're going to act on it. Uh, so that's really what more the sense you're getting here uh, from this this idea of the Lord remembering. Um, also, there's this thing that the Bible likes to do. We call it, uh, here's your big fancy word for the day, anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. It's when you ascribe human attributes to God so that you can kind of better understand how he operates. Um, so this is one of those anthropomorphisms saying that he would remember, uh, remember him. And this is always just given before he takes uh, direct action. Hmm. All right, there on page 11, uh, second question, um, God will choose this murderer, referring to Moses, to deliver his people out of Egypt. What's it tell us about how God treats people? This is very applicable to the sermon today, by the way. We're all sinners and treats us all the same. Yeah, he, he doesn't pick the holies of holies to be his people. He picks sinners. He picks outcasts. I mean, there, there are some people who go to the extreme to say that all murderers would be excluded from heaven. Um, if you're going to do that, I mean, you're going to lose out on some key men of the Bible, including Moses and David. Um, you know, people who are actually spoke of as godly people. Paul. Yeah. Paul, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah the, the slight caveat with Paul is he may not have directly laid his hands to kill someone, but he definitely got them to the execution floor. Same thing with David. Yeah, yeah, that's right. David, 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 David arranged it, but didn't himself murder. That's a good point. Um, so yeah, it just tells us again, um, no matter who we are, no matter what our sin is, God has removed that from us as far as the East is from the West. And so God will use any of us. There's none of us who are too sinful or too far gone for the Lord. All right. Chapter three. Now let's go ahead and um, yeah, we'll just read chapter three uh, and then we'll pick back up uh, chapter four. All right, so chapter 3 of Exodus. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, he called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, 
and this will be a sign to you that it, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of, the, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you, what have been what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, uh, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. All right, so chapter 3. What strange sight does Moses see? Burning bush. Yeah, a burning bush that... Wasn't burning. That doesn't burn, yeah. Doesn't and actually burn. Chemistry up. major, is that possible? <laughs> really? <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. Um, who speaks to him? Yeah, God. How does he identify himself, Sierra? Yeah, the I am. Um, so God identifies himself as the I am. And there's another way he identifies himself. But first, with the I am, what does that tell us about God? He is. First of all, just simply that he exists. In present tense. Yeah. And Not I was. I don't really know yeah. if you're going to go into it, but in, in the version that I'm reading, it had like one of those little like footnote things and it said, I will be who I will be and say, I am. Essentially. Yeah. I will be who I will be, I am. So you've got this idea of past present, future, another way of saying he's eternal, right? Just simply he exists. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He exists. So what else do you get out of the, out of this identification, I am? What else does that tell us about God? He's unique. He's, he is unique. He's for sure. the person of the Trinity. Or just simply, he's a personal God. I, I have my own personality. I am a living entity. I am a person. I mean, understand that correctly. I'm not like you and me, but I am. Like, I am an actual being. So anything else that you just get out of uh, I am? So yeah, you get Other this. when Jesus uses the I am's in the Gospels? Oh, yeah, that's meant to get us to connecting back to this, um, to the I am. I mean, that's, that's looking forward. But, yeah, that he has his own freedom, his own personality. He's not just... Kind of this mist floating around, um, 
a magical force, so to speak. You know, he is a, a, a true personal being. All right. Um, there's another way the voice identifies himself. What is the other way? Uh, the one speaking from the, the burning bush that doesn't burn up identifies himself. He's the god of their forefathers, basically. Yeah. It's the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. So what does that tell us about God? Tell us about the person, this being speaking. Uh, he is specifically the one who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not some other dude. So, and just like we read at the very end of chapter two, he's the God of what? Was he remembering? The promises. Covenant. Yeah, God of the covenant. What's the covenant? You will prosper. Yeah. Um, all nations <clears throat> blessed through you and your offspring. Mainly, most important offspring, Jesus. Yeah, you know, the promise of the Savior. So if he's the God of the covenant, what does it also tell us about him? That he just didn't pop into existence? Yeah, well, yeah, that kind of goes back into here. Yep. So he's not, he's not new. So he's a promise keeper. Purposely bringing this up so that they remember, hey, I made promises to you. Yeah, it's like almost 500 years later, I'm still going to keep them. So, uh, so yeah, so you've got a lot of things uh, that you can get um, out of this section. I think uh, this this one is using a little bit more New Testament quote, um, but when Jesus Jesus actually refers back to when he says, "I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob," he actually does use this to say, "I'm a God of the living and not of the dead." So it actually points to eternal life too. But that's kind of a side point. You need the New Testament to understand that one. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is this is uh, what we get out of the two identifying names of God. So here we go. We get the, uh, we get the, another fancy, you got anthropomorphism is your first $10 word for the day. Your second $10 word for the day is tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton stands for the four lettered word. <laughs> That's what it just means. The four lettered word is there at the top of page 13. Uh, so what is that? How many of you have seen that before? Those characters. No one? No. Okay, Sierra. <laughs> does it mean Jehovah? Or? Yeah, yeah, it like, does it. <laughs> I don't know. How many have seen that before, those four letters? Okay. So, okay, we got the, the two. Alphabet. It is the Hebrew alphabet. Um, these four letters, anytime in your NIV Bibles and most other English Bibles, you see capital L-O-R-D. This is the word they're translating. Uh, from Hebrew. So this is Hebrew. Uh, so there are people, most notably the Jehovah's Witnesses, who claim that God's one and only true name is Jehovah. And they base that idea from this verse. Uh, so Exodus 14 and 3, 14 and 15. Ancient Hebrew is an alphabet consisting of entirely of consonants. There are no vowels in Hebrew language. It's all consonants. Um, so vowel pointing was added later, thanks to the Masoretes, um, who diligently copied and preserved the Old Testament. 
Uh, the name used here in Exodus 3 is only four letters long and would most likely be pronounced Yahweh. Um, so that's how you'd probably say that. Because um, you get... So I think it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, Yahweh. Yahweh. Um, okay. So where does Jehovah come from? This one's fun. I think it's fun. Two words like mashed together. There's a Lutheran satire on this. It's there, there is. Um, I, I find the Lutheran satire a little overly complicated, so I wasn't going to show it today. Um, sometime after the Jewish exile to Babylon, but before Jesus was born, the Jews feared misusing God's name so much, which is second commandment, you don't misuse the name of the Lord your God, they stopped pronouncing the name altogether and instead substituted the word Adonai in its place, a word meaning master or Lord. So you see English, we kind of lose a little bit because we say Lord, Lord, but the capital L-O-R-D is different from small L. Like you'd say Lord, like my master, you're, you're the one who is in charge of me. Um, modern day Jews do continue this practice by writing G dash D instead of God, if you've ever seen that in Jewish writings. That's why they still do it. They're actually afraid of the second commandment of misusing the name of the Lord your God. Reflecting this practice, the Masoretes would insert the vowel pointing for Adonai in the Hebrew text whenever Yahweh appeared. So Adonai would look kind of like this. Ah. I remember there's another letter here. Shoot. I'm going to look it up. Give me a sec, because I can't, I can't stand not having it. I don't know in Hebrew. There we go. Okay. Not sure I didn't look right. One extra letter in here. All right. So then we get a do nine. Um, so this should go over here. There we go. So, yeah, you put in the vowel pointing here, you get a, ah, o, oh, i. So then, because they're so afraid to say this word, because we don't want to break the second commandment, they would just say this word. So they just read this word anytime they saw this word. So if you came across a verse and it said, and the Lord said, you'd say, Adonai said, um, instead of this. So to help people remember that, they take these vowels, and put it on to this word. So now this word becomes ya o o va. It's taking what should be this word and putting the vowels onto it and mispronouncing it. That's how you get the word Jehovah. So in other words, Jehovah is not the name of the Lord. Um, and so especially if um, you are uh, a fan of Indiana Jones and uh, the Last Crusade, you know, the name of the Lord, it's Jehovah, but in Latin, it's with an I. Yeah, none of that applies. <laughs> um, you would, like this would be an I, if strictly transliterating this to Latin. But yeah, the actual name of the Lord is... Uh, Yahweh, if you want to be a little bit more technical with it, Adonai is a name for God, but more of a generic name. So Jehovah is not the one and only true name of God. And to say Jehovah is, is actually, that's just something that crept in thanks to the King James Version of the Bible, because they said Jehovah. That's where it comes from. It comes from the King James Version, not the actual name of God. So there you go. 
So yeah, anyone who tells you Jehovah is the only name of God, they don't know their Hebrew. Okay. Uh, so thinking back here, Exodus 3, uh, top of page 14. Uh, what challenges would Moses face in going back to Egypt? The Lord calls him to go back, get my people out of there. What challenges are is Moses going to face in doing this? He was a murderer, so they're, uh, they're still going to try to call him to task for that. Yeah, so you remember him. <laughs> that's kind of the thing of like we 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 don't have it explicitly spelled out right now, um, but we do know it's forty years have passed, and that is kind of a question. I wonder how long wanted signs would would stay up, but. Regardless of whether or not the law is looking for him, there's still a point. Um, yeah, he still knows. A well, murderer. He still knows it, even if people have forgotten. Um, so, yeah, he's still looking back there. And there might still be people who remember this. And, oh, yeah, Moses, he left after he murdered that Egyptian. I mean, walk back with a reputation like that. You're coming back as a criminal. Um, you at least know it, even if people have forgotten. What else would uh, Moses kind of encounter uh, problems in coming back to Egypt? With a new pharaoh? Yeah. So yeah, you got yeah, new pharaoh, new leadership. Yeah, there, I have no ends to this. How will this person accept me? What else? What else might be problems for Moses in coming back to Egypt? Those people don't know him. Yeah. Or they don't. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah, Israelites don't know him. I mean, we even have here, you know, it's election year. Uh, we have in our, um, or is it specifically, is it in the, in the Bill of Rights or is it in the Constitution about not having a foreign-born leader of the United States anymore? Um, okay, so in the Constitution proper? I don't know if it was in one of the amendments. Okay. So that's the thing. Like, you don't let this guy who just like comes in out of nowhere, who is he? Just, you're just gonna lead us? Where have you been the last 40 years? Um, yeah, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a huge problem uh, to overcome. Anything else? No, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna be very receptive to anybody who hasn't had, been under the same yoke of tyranny that they've been under. Like, you're not one of us. Some guy just pops in saying, hey, I'm here to save you. <laughs> yeah. He's pretty old at this time too. He's 80. 80. Yeah. So he would be 80. Do do, old man? <laughs> Not. Never right, Julia. Bring it, old man. <laughs> yeah. Now, granted, <laughs> Moses will live another 40 years yet. He'll, so he'll get to live to be 120. And that was outside of normal life expectancy in his day and age. Um, I know, but most people see back, uh, Soldiers, you know, combat people is not not eighty years old. They usually don't, they no. don't fight wars by then. Well, no, I bring this up because Psalm ninety, which is written by Moses, says we are blessed if we live to be seventy or eighty. So Moses is even acknowledging, like, uh, life expectancy. I should have died, <laughs> um, but I didn't. Yeah, he's not young, so that's good. Um, any other ones you want to add? Otherwise, I'm good. Move on. Okay. Uh, one of the other things, and I think this has always been one, particularly for me, um, why bother requesting a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord when the Lord is going to rescue them out of Egypt and bring them to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? This just doesn't feel honest. Like, why bother saying, well, let us go for a three-day journey to worship when God is saying, what I'm setting in motion is to get you to the promised land. So why, why do this? Why, why have Moses go to Pharaoh with the request, give us a three-day journey so that we can go out and worship? I 
Never thought of it. I have no idea. Oh, okay. I guess I'm the only one who gets tripled by that. So the, so the thing is called build their faith on the way? That definitely will be a part of it. Um, yeah, that definitely will be a part of it. Because Moses is even telling to the elders, like, hey, we're going to rescue you, but we're going to ask for a three-day journey. So I ask for a three-day journey when they know the end goal is complete exodus like they're getting out of egypt i don't know no's going to be no regardless so you know from pharaoh's perspective you're not going anywhere whether you're going permanently or temporarily you're not going anywhere so, so I, I don't i don't i don't get it now so this is the thing about it this way if moses would have been all right not moses uh pharaoh if Pharaoh would have just been like, yeah, sure, go off for three days. Now, granted, God could use this. And then he's like, well, okay, well, we're out this far. Let's just keep going. But because you know what Pharaoh's answer is going to be, and God even tells Moses what Pharaoh's answer is going to be, he's using something lesser to then get them to the greater. So just, he won't even allow a three-day journey. So there's no way he's letting you go. So I'm going to convince him with a mighty hand. Uh, I'm going to, to push the envelope because you're going to see how unreasonable uh, he is, which they already probably know very well. So it just gives this opportunity um, to come with a lesser request, exercise some diplomacy, and then find out how unreasonable he really is until then the Lord's mighty hand uh, forces them. Um, so yeah, they know their situation not going to get any better, but yeah. Okay. Um, also just kind of keep in mind, this will come up a couple more times in, in the book of Exodus. Um, here's the first time it said you will plunder the Egyptians. Um, so just kind of remember, yeah, they're going to plunder the Egyptians before they leave. That's going to lead to a couple other things in the book of Exodus. All right. Um, then just in this chapter, before we read uh, chapter 4, Moses is objecting. He objects five times total through chapters 3 and 4. What objection did we get so far? Who am I? Yeah. I'm nobody. Yeah, objection. So first one, yeah, who am I? And again, from chapter two, and just already what we talked about too, we can understand where he's coming from. Who am I? He remembers, I tried that once. I killed an Egyptian. No one rallied behind me. And now I've been wandering for 40 years. I haven't been with my people for 40 years. They've suffered without me. I'm completely disconnected. Who am I? Who am I to do this? Um, is, is what you say. Now, what is... Um, God's answer to who am I? I will be with you. Yeah. Answer. I will be with you. In other words, who cares who you are? I'm going with you. I'm the Lord. <laughs> um, who cares who you are? You have me. I go with you. So that's, that's, the, that's the response to that. Second objection that we heard, chapter three. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but who are you? <laughs> and we did this one already, but the answer to that, who are you? I am. I am. And then also? Uh, yeah. Out of Eric. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. I'm the God who always is your personal God. I am the God of the covenant. I'm remembering that. I'm acting on it. Um, so that's who you say when you go to the elders. All right. Now let's uh, pick up um, chapter four. We're going to keep answering this question. 
Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? So third objection. You're lying. I think I'm full of it. <laughs> Uh, I, I really I like. <laughs> they kind of work, yeah. Um, yeah, I like all those. But he answers like, that in three, before he even gets to that point. He says the elders will believe you. I know, I know, and then it's like, but, 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 what if they don't? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's like you said, the elders will listen to you. What, what if they don't? <laughs> um, all right. So the answers, uh, verse two, the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Uh -uh. So Moses reached out and took it. Yeah, so snake handling, I guess. Did anybody know anything about snake handling? Do you grab them by don't, the tail? Don't, don't. Just don't. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody, I don't know. I thought you just didn't grab them by the head. No, no, you you grab them by the head. I actually thought you do you grab, grab them by the, the head, head, right? They around and they bite. Yeah, that's what I thought. Is that? Does anybody know? That's why you. That's why you step on them first. <laughs> you just kill them for. You that's just that's kill them. Yeah, yeah, that's what the hole is for. The hole's got a really long handle. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. If you do, is that <laughs> lawnmower? Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Julia's got something. Sometimes depends on the kind of uh, venomous or not. We're assuming it's venomous. Yeah. Because um, most likely this is like an asp um, or a cobra, kind of like that. Um, it's probably the, the type of snake. Anaconda. But yeah, because if you grab it by the tail, like exactly what Gavin said, that was my understanding too, is that it can twist its body and come up and bite you. So grabbing it by the tail is not the safest place to grab it. Yeah, I think it's actually grabbing it from behind the head so that it can't it can't bite you. So Julius is by the tail and a stick to control the head. Oh, a stick to control you. Because like like yeah. okay. I was say, you get to the head, you'll only get struck. Yeah, like if you're going for it. Yeah. So anyway, like, like I said, probably best solution is grab the hoe and, and <laughs> go and after the it. The shovel. Yeah. Or the mower. I like the mower. But anyway, yeah, so that's one of those little things like maybe you don't remember. Yeah, Moses was scared of the his staff turning a snake. And wouldn't you be? <laughs> you have this wooden staff, throw it down, becomes this venomous snake. Pep, pep, pep. Ah! <laughs> uh, all right. So reach out, verse four, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. When he took it out, it was leprous like snow. Um, are you guys aware leprosy, Hansen's disease, basically? Um, it's a skin disease. Your skin starts kind of decaying on your body. Um, it sometimes will go away, but most of the time, if you had leprosy, you know, you're separated from everybody, so you don't infect anybody else, because this, this can be nasty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, um, so seven, verse seven, now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and he took it out, and it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. All right. So, uh, but will they believe God's answer? But well, here's this cool thing. We're going to find out. And then if not, then here's this other cool thing. Then we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, so three signs. So the staff, the snake, and leprous, leprous hand. Yeah. And the last one. Blood. Yeah, water to blood. Hmm, foreshadowing. Okay. So yeah, three signs, three powerful signs. Because it's even like, yeah, if they don't even buy the first one or the first two, here's a third one. 
All right. 10, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Fourth objection. Well, public speaker. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not good at public speaking, which when we read those New Testament passages last week, it's almost like, Moses, you're lying. <laughs> Because uh, he was actually known to be uh, good at speaking. All right. Um, verse 11. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. So the answer? I'll go with you. And tell you yeah. what to say. Yeah. I'll tell you what to say. I'll be your own speech writer on this. Like, you don't even have to, to think about this. You can just say it. Like, I'm going to give you the words to say. Um, and then verse 13, but Moses said, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Fifth objection. Please I don't no. want to go. Just no. Yeah. Send someone else. Just, just no. Just no. And the Lord's answer, uh, verse 14, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, mm -hmm. and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You will speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and, and, and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. So the answer? Yeah. Aaron, we'll go with you. So that's, um, I bring this up because can we not just relate to Moses? You know, when we're, there are things we are supposed to do for God and we can come up with five, 10, 20 objections. And, and kind of at the end, isn't this really kind of what it is? <laughs> it's not really these things. Like I do have these questions, but really... I just, can you send someone else? Can, can you have somebody else do this, please? I, I don't want to. I don't want to do this. Um, but yet God answers all of our objections, and that's what he's good at. He's good at just taking them away. Um, just taking away all our objections. Um, and so this is good just to see how he works with Moses. All right, let's finish up uh, chapter 4 here. Verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, plural, we got two of them now, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt, and took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform uh, before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Um, just pausing there, um, looking at page 15 in the study guide, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Uh, what does it mean to harden one's heart? What does it mean to harden someone's heart? Stubborn. Yeah, stubborn generally in a, in a like, I'm not going to give way on this, right? Mm. I think stubborn is a, is, a, is a good way. You're just, you're choosing, nope, 
not doing this. I am just absolutely hard to this, not going to change my mind, not going to happen. Um, so that's what's going to happen here. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart will come up at least 18 times in the following chapters. As the phrase comes up, note, um, sorry, there's an extra comma there. Or, no, that's a, sorry, that's a dot. Uh, note the subject, God or Pharaoh, the tense of the, uh, of the verb, um, past, future, present, each time. Sorry, a couple typos that I missed there. Um, but, so in this first one, uh, so you got the first one, 421. Who is the subject, God or Pharaoh? Who's doing the hardening? God. So is it past, future, present? Will, future. So that's fear. So here you go. You got the first one, 421. Uh, God is the subject. It is a future. So you can write uh, future um, in there next to God under 421. Um, so I'll try to point this out. We'll come back to it as each of the references come. If you really want to, you can just look ahead and fill it out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it does kind of show something neat because we'll talk about it um, in the end. Look at the spoils the ending. Because <laughs> you never heard this story before, right, Gav? Nope. All right, hardening the heart. Um, the Bible teaches that human beings are free to make choices. God is good and always acts consistently with his nature, yet people can choose to rebel against God's goodness and consistent rebellion can lead to their hearts being hardened. As the saying goes, the same sun that melts butter also hardens clay. Well, that's a nice little phrase. I don't know where they got that. Uh, Egyptian pharaohs believed that they were divine and Pharaoh would never have been inclined to submit to the Israelites' God. Each time God placed a demand on him, he became more determined to resist. Thus, it was both God's demands and Pharaoh's own pride-motivated stubbornness that led his hardened heart, uh, led to his hardened heart. God would use Pharaoh's stubbornness for a good end to demonstrate his power and extend his reputation. All right, um, now let's finish up chapter four, and we're going to get a really kind of weird thing that happens. All right, <laughs> so verse 24. Um, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. Go to the Lord. Uh, so the Lord let him go. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. This is just weird. <laughs> like... So I, I read a lot of commentaries, and basically page 16 is what I can make of this situation. So uh, it is an episode that's difficult to understand. Moses has two sons at this point. We already met Gershom. Uh, Exodus 18.4 reveals the name of the second son, which is Eliezer. Circumcision is a sign given uh, to Abraham of God's one-sided covenant to save all humans through the offspring of the woman who had crushed Satan's head, a blessing for all nations. Since only one son is circumcised in this account, it seems likely that Eliezer, the younger son, was the one not circumcised. Moses himself was most likely circumcised when he was eight days old, according to the Lord's command. Being a descendant of Abraham, Zipporah's family would have most likely been familiar with the covenant promise of circumcision and practiced it. Failure to circumcise the male following Abraham's faith brought with it the threat to be cut off from God's people. Did Moses begin doubting his faith in the Lord's promises and thus didn't circumcise his second son? Did Zipporah go along with Moses' decision to not circumcise Eliezer, knowing that it was against God's will to do so? Had Zipporah opposed Eliezer's circumcision and Moses went along with what his wife wanted, which also was contrary to God's word? Regardless of the answers to these questions, it's enough to know that this is how serious the Lord is in regard to the sign of circumcision and the threat for failing to do so. If Moses was to speak for Abraham's God, who was in the process of keeping his covenant promises to Abraham, uh, Moses needed to observe the sign of that covenant. By Eliezer's circumcision, Moses' family is now set apart as believers in God's one-sided covenant to save all people. 
that's the most I can make out of this situation. So circumcision, really important. Um, and if you're going to act as God's mouthpiece and not circumcise your kids, that'd be like a pastor, if you can think of it that way, a pastor refusing to baptize one of his sons, but baptizing the other one. Like, What message does that send to you? Um, mixed at best. Um, but there seems to be something going on here. We're not fully aware of that, but this forces the issue. Uh, reading ahead to Exodus 18, Moses may have sent his family home to Midian at this time, but that might have also happened after the Exodus that maybe they went on ahead uh, to his father-in-law uh, to announce their success. Either way, a reunion gets recorded in Exodus chapter 18. So wrapping up now, um, after the weird circumcision thing. Uh, verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything uh, the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. So, hey, it goes okay, Moses. All those objections, oh, we're good. Um, by the way, it keeps talking about the mountain. Um, so it is called Mount Horeb. Also, we know it as Mount Sinai. So you know they are coming back. They are going to be coming back to this place just as the Lord promised. So it goes well. Goes well to reunite with the Israelites. Um, and then so next week we'll start talking about going to Pharaoh. All right. Um, any questions? Okay. Nope. Okay. Well, then let's, uh, let's close with prayer and then we'll pick up Exodus uh, 5 next week. So let's pray. Lord, so often we just deem ourselves unworthy to do things, and maybe it is a combination of remembering our sins of the past. Or maybe it's just a desire to not want to be involved and to not uh, seek out confrontation when it comes to you and your word. Like you did with Moses, remove all our objections. Remind us that you are with us. If you're with us, if you're for us, who then can ever stand against us? Give us that boldness and that confidence as you did for Moses. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So thank you, buddy. We'll pick up Exodus chapter 5 next week. So thank you, everybody. God has a soft spot for uh, Google Meet. For, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of a neat.